us after the summer months. Amen? Let's praise God once more. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Asbury. If I haven't met you, my name is Chris Jones. I'm one of the pastors here of this congregation. I've been out for a couple of weeks, uh, taking some time off, but I am grateful to Pastor Will and to our staff for doing such a great job leading while I was away. But it is good to be back here this morning uh, with all of you. Uh, Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this beautiful morning uh, that you have gifted us with uh, for the month of September and all the excitement that the fall season brings us. Uh, We pray, God, that in all things, uh, we would remain faithful to you. Uh, As we start this new sermon series, uh, please open up our hearts and our minds. Speak to us that we would indeed, God, receive a word that would make a difference in our lives. (coughs) It's all for your sake. It's all for your glory. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So this morning, we are diving in, and I use that phrase, diving in, with intentionality and purpose. We are diving into a new sermon series on the biblical figure of Jonah. So I'm curious, how many of you have ever heard of Jonah before? Well, the thing about Jonah is, even if you're not that familiar with the Bible, you've probably heard of him. Most people have heard of Jonah. But just because we've heard of Jonah does not necessarily mean that we know his story. And if what we know of Jonah's story matches what most people know, the extent of our knowledge might be that he was swallowed by a really big fish. If what we know about Jonah, excuse me, my voice is changing. (laughs) I'm 37 years old. It was bound to happen at some point. (laughs) If what we know of Jonah matches what most people know, the extent of our knowledge might be that he was swallowed by a really big fish. That's it. And yet, folks, the reality is the story of Jonah goes so much deeper than that. And that's why we've entitled this sermon series, Jonah, Deeper Than a Fish Story. So over the next four Sundays, our congregation here at Asbury is going to be plunging the depths of Jonah's story, uh, discovering just how theologically and spiritually rich it really is. And I have a challenge for all of us. Are you listening? My challenge for us as we kick off this new series is to read the book of Jonah in its entirety at least once a week. Can you do that? Listen, this is not difficult. In most Bibles, the book of Jonah is two pages. It's four chapters. It won't take you more than five or ten minutes to read. But please, trust me when I say there is so much, there is so much in the book of Jonah to discover and unpack. Now, I was tempted to begin my sermon this morning with a lengthy introduction. But then as I was studying Jonah this week, something stood out to me. Jonah doesn't begin that way. Jonah doesn't begin with a lengthy introduction. Instead, the writer just, and here's that phrase again, dives in. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive straight into the story of Jonah. We're going to start at the very beginning. This is Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You see what I mean? There's no elaborate introduction. There's no gentle lead in. The writer just starts. One day, Almighty God comes to Jonah. God says to Jonah, get up, go to Nineveh, that large city, and announce my judgment against it because I have seen just how evil, wicked, corrupt its people really are. But instead of doing what God wants, Jonah goes in the opposite direction. He tries to escape God's call. Now, as a bit of background, Jonah was a prophet, uh, meaning he was somebody whom God regularly called upon to deliver messages. Uh, Prophets during this period of time, they were basically um, spokespeople for God, mouthpieces for God. God would give the prophet a message, and then that prophet would deliver that message on behalf of God to the people. And even though Jonah only shows up one other time in the Old Testament, he's also mentioned in the New Testament, but he shows up only one other time in the Old Testament, that reference shows us that even before this story took place, the story that we're going to talk about, well, even before all that, God had already used Jonah in a pretty powerful way. Here's that earlier mention of Jonah in the Old Testament. This is from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, 
verse 25. Jeroboam II recovered the territories of Israel between Labo Hamath and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. Well, during Jonah's time period, um, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Uh, you had the northern kingdom, which retained the name Israel, and then you had the southern kingdom. What was the southern kingdom called? Judah. So you had Israel, you had Judah. And Israel and Judah had their own kings, their own monarchs. And that's what the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings is all about, talking about those different kings. Well, the northern kingdom had really bad kings. In fact, the northern kingdom didn't have any good kings. All of them were bad and corrupt according to scripture. Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom, he was no exception. He was a bad king. But one good thing did happen during his reign, as it says there in 2 Kings 14. Israel had lost some territory, but during Jeroboam's reign, Jeroboam II, Israel was able to get that territory back, and God had inspired Jonah to announce that that was going to happen. And Jonah got to see that that was going to happen within his lifetime. So he got to deliver that good news, that this territory, Israel's going to get it back. So let me ask us this question. How do you think Jonah felt after his prophecy came true? Well, the text doesn't tell us this. But he was a human like us, so I think it's safe to assume that he probably felt pretty good. I mean, this was some good news that he was giving. We're going to get our land back, and he got to see it happen within his own lifetime. So he probably felt pretty good. Who knows? Maybe Jonah thought that after this happened, he could relax. He could take it easy. He had reached the pinnacle of his service to God. Here's the first lesson, though, that I want us to notice in Jonah's story. God is never done using us. God is never done using us. Listen, there is no retiring when it comes to God. As long as we're alive, as long as we have a pulse, as long as we are breathing, God wants to use us in some way to make a difference. And here's the other truth that ties in with all this. When we get comfortable after God uses us in one way, that's often when God calls us to something new. Um, after I finished seminary, uh, I served for three years as an associate pastor at a church in Fruitland Park. You ever heard of Fruitland Park before? Fruitland Park, Florida, just south of the villages, which a lot of people have heard of, uh, Leesburg area, Lake County, and it was a growing congregation. I was actually the first associate pastor that that church had ever had. And I really had a great time serving that church. I loved every minute of it. Well, during my third year, uh, we found out that the senior pastor was going to be moving. Uh, he was being reassigned to a church in Tallahassee, Florida. And he had been there for a while. He had been there for 12 years. And a lot of good things had happened uh, during his leadership. And so um, I assumed that as the person in the second chair role, the associate, that since he was going to be leaving with all these changes ahead, I was going to be staying at the church for at least one more year, if not longer, to help with all that transition. Well, one evening, uh, we had a meeting with our district superintendent. Uh, her name is Sue. Uh, she's actually a bishop now in Virginia. But Sue came to this meeting with some of our leadership, and she confirmed that Mike was going to be leaving. And um, She also asked us those characteristics that we were looking for in our next senior pastor. Well, after that meeting was over, uh, she and I were walking together in the hallway, and there was a document that I needed her to sign. It was about a continuing education event that I was going to go to. I needed um, her approval. So she came into my office and she signed it. And then as she and I were talking, she said to me, Hey, Chris, I was wondering, obviously Mike's going to be leaving, but would you also be open to going to a new church and serving as the senior pastor there? And I was kind of caught off guard because I had had this assumption that I was going to stay. And I said, Well, you know, Sue, I appreciate you asking me that. But I'm really happy here. And so if you're asking me my preference, my preference is to stay. And maybe we can have this conversation next year. And she said to me, okay, well, um, all right. But just so you know, I might be calling you later on this year, depending on what happens. Well, sure enough, a month later, she calls me on the phone. In fact, it was four days before we were going to publicly announce that I was going to be staying at the church 
and that the senior pastor was going to be leaving. It was a Thursday morning. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. I was actually doing my morning devotion. And I heard my phone ringing. And I look at the caller ID, and it says her name, Sue Harper Johnson. My heart just about fell out of my chest. I knew exactly what this phone call was about. So I answered the phone. I tried to be calm. I tried to be relaxed and collected. I wasn't, but I tried to be. And she said, Chris, the bishop and I would like to send you to Community of Faith United Methodist Church in Davenport, Florida. That was the congregation I served before I came to Asbury. And I was so just surprised by what she was saying. My immediate response was, okay, so you want me to be the interim pastor there, and then I'll come back to my role as the associate pastor, right? I'll, I'll just be there for about a month or two, and then I'll come back, and I'll, and I'll you know, assume my job as the associate. She laughed, and she said, no, that's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you're going to be the senior pastor there come July 1. A couple of weeks later, I uh, keep a prayer journal, and I wrote out this prayer to God in that prayer journal. Lord, I can't believe it. What a whirlwind these last few weeks have been. I'm going to serve a community of faith. I truly thought I was going to stay in Fruitland Park for another year. This is all so surreal. If this is where you're sending me, surely there will be challenges but I trust you will guide me through them. You will work with me, and if necessary, in spite of me. Again, I'm speculating a little bit here, but it's possible, it is possible, maybe probable, Jonah got comfortable in his service to God after that prophecy came true in 2 Kings. And in a similar sense, we can get comfortable in our service to God, but that's often when God invites us to take on something new, something that challenges our gifts, that pushes our um, limited abilities or what we perceive to be our limited abilities, uh, something that gets us outside of our comfort zone. Uh, I have a pastor friend whose name is Will. Not Will Condust, although he's also my friend and he's a pastor. But another pastor friend I have in mind, his name is Will. We went to college together. He serves a church in North Carolina. He has this great way of putting it. I, I, I love this, and I think you're going to love it too. He says, God is like a parent buying shoes for their small child. When I was taking some time off, uh, my family and I, we went to Fort Lauderdale where I grew up, and we went to this restaurant, and as we were leaving the restaurant, I said to Amanda, you see that shoe store over there? That's where my mom would take me when I was a kid to buy shoes. Do you remember going with your parents to the shoe store when you were a kid? Or do you remember taking your own children to the shoe store? You know, whenever my mom would take me there, I would try on shoes, and you know, you walk around, and you try to see how they feel, and my mom would ask me, how do those shoes feel? And I would say, well, mom, honestly, they feel a little bit big. And what would she say to me? The same thing that every parent says to their child when the child complains at the shoe store that the shoes are too big. What did she say? You'll grow into them. That's okay. You'll grow into them. Folks, I think that's what God says to us when God invites us to take on something new. Hey, how does that assignment feel? How does it feel to be the senior pastor of that church? How does it feel to lead that Bible study? How does it feel to teach that Sunday school class? How does it feel to facilitate that small group? How does it feel to serve in that committee, to chair that committee? How does it feel to stand in front of a congregation of people and testify to the work that God has done in your life? Well, God, honestly, it feels a little bit big. It feels a little bit uncomfortable. God says, that's okay. You'll grow into it and I'll be with you every step of the way. But when it came to Jonah, he wasn't open to growing into this new assignment, was he? Because the place that God wanted to send the prophet was the very last place that he wanted to go. And what was that? Nineveh. Nineveh. Even just the name Nineveh sounds kind of, ooh, gives you chills, doesn't it? Now, Nineveh back then was the capital city of Assyria, uh, the Assyrian Empire. That was the dominant empire during Jonah's day. And among the Israelites, Nineveh did not exactly have the best reputation, and that's a kind way of putting it. In fact, listen with me 
to what another Old Testament prophet, Nahum, had to say about Nineveh. This is from Nahum chapter 3, uh, verse 1 and verse 3. Nahum says, what sorrow awaits Nineveh, the city of murder and lies. Now, folks, how is that for a city description? Put that on a billboard, right? Come to Nineveh. Live it up in Nineveh, the city of murder and lies. She is crammed with wealth and is never without victims. See the flashing swords and glittering spears as the charioteers charge past. There are countless casualties, heaps of bodies, so many bodies that people stumble over them. Nineveh wasn't just known for conquering people. It was known for torturing and mutilating them. I'm not going to get into all the details here, and I'm sure you're grateful for that. But let me just share one thing with you. Up here on the screen, take a look at this picture. This is a carving that archaeologists uncovered from the ancient city of Nineveh. Now, what do you see here? You see a gentleman here, um, or you see a man here, he's holding a human head. And then there are other heads on the ground, decapitated heads. You see the bodies as well. Keep in mind, by the way, that this carving was not created by Nineveh's critics. It was created by the people of Nineveh themselves. This was their social media back then. This was their way of advertising, boasting about, showing off their cruelty, just how bad they really were. Is it any wonder that Jonah didn't want to go there? I mean, come on, let's be honest with ourselves. Would we want to go there? Would we want to go and tell people, hey, by the way, God's judgment is against you. God is mad at you. God is upset with you. God's going to, you know, destroy you. No, none of us would want to do that. Jonah did what any of us probably would have done. He ran away. Listen again to verse 3. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, I want us to notice something here. Uh, we have this map up here on the screen. Uh, this is really helpful to look at. gives us a clearer picture of what's happening in the story. Now, according to 2 Kings, Jonah was from Gath Hefer. Can you see Gath Hefer up here? Nineveh, and today Nineveh would be in Iraq, uh, Nineveh was to the north of Gath Heifer, so presumably Jonah was in, was in his hometown. God came to him. God said, I want you to go there. So if Jonah had listened to God, he would have gone north to Nineveh, but instead, as the text tells us, he went in the opposite direction. He went to Joppa, a port city, and then from there, he got on a ship headed for Tarshish. Now today, where would Tarshish be? Spain. This was the edge of the known world. People thousands of years ago in this part of the world, they didn't know about the Americas. They didn't know about North America, South America. They didn't know about Australia. This was as far away from Nineveh as anybody could imagine going. Jonah was determined not to go there. And it's kind of funny when we think about it. Because the whole reason Jonah got on that ship and went to Tarshish, or tried to go to Tarshish, was to get away from God, wasn't it? In fact, that phrase, escape from the Lord, shows up not once, it shows up two times in verse 3. Notice again. It says, but Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. There's the first reference. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to do what? Escape from the Lord. There it is again. By sailing to Tarshish. The writer isn't being repetitive for repetition's sake. The writer is driving home the point. Jonah was trying his darndest to get away from God. And folks, that's funny. We should laugh about that. Because a prophet of all people should know what? You can't get away from God. It's impossible to get away from God. God is what we call omnipresent. What does that mean? God is everywhere. Scripture tells us this truth time and again. Uh, listen with me to what David wrote in my favorite psalm, uh, which is Psalm 139. I can never escape from your spirit, David says. can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. 
and your sphinx will support you. This isn't complicated. This is basic theology. This is theology 101. No matter where we go, God is all we see. One of my favorite books when I was growing up, uh, a book that a man and I now enjoy reading to our children, is The Runaway Bunny by Margaret Wise Brown. Do you remember this one? It was published back in the 1940s. It's never gone out of print. It is a classic children's book. And I'm going to give us the spoiler, okay? Or you're not supposed to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. One day, this little bunny comes to his mother. And the bunny says, Mom, I'm running away. And the mother says, okay, well, if you run away, I'm going to come after you because you're my little bunny. You belong to me. And the bunny says, okay, well, if you come after me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become a fish and a trout stream, and I'm going to swim away from you. And the mother says, okay, well, if you become a fish and swim away, I'll become a fisherman, and I'll fish for you. And the bunny says, all right, then I'll become a rock on a high mountain. And the mother says, if you become a rock on a high mountain, then I'll become a climber, and I'll climb to you. This next part reminds me of Jonah for obvious reasons. The bunny says, I'll become a sailboat, and I'll sail away from you. And the mother says, if you become a sailboat and sail away from me, I'll become what? The wind. And when you're reading books to kids, you've got to do the sound effects. I'll become the wind and blow you to where I am. Jesus would say, those with ears to hear, let them hear. The story, this simple children's book, actually gives us a picture into who God is. Always there, always present, no matter what. We can't get away from God. Jonah, of all people, should have known that. And in truth, I think Jonah did know that. I mean, come on, Jonah wasn't foolish. He was a faithful Israelite. He knew the truth that you can't get away from God. But do you see? It didn't stop him from trying because that's how stubborn he was. That's how determined he was to not go to Nineveh. It's easy for us as modern-day readers of this text to criticize Jonah and to pick on him for not doing what God commanded. And yet, if we're honest, we do the same thing all the time. Spiritual rebellion, in a nutshell, happens any time that we say no to God. And we say no to God more than we would care to admit. For example, we say no to God when we refuse to put God first in our finances. God says, your money is my money, and I want you to trust me with your money by giving a portion over to your church so that my work might go forward in the world, and we hold on to it, and we say, no, God, I don't know about that. I can give you this, I can give you this, but not this. We say no to God when we would rather criticize and complain about what's going on in the church instead of actually stepping it up and volunteering and trying to make a real difference. We say no to God more than we care to admit. And here's the other thing about spiritual rebellion. We will always look for some way to justify it, won't we? Because we want to see ourselves in a positive light. We'll always look for some way to justify it. Jonah went to Joppa, and he found this ship that was headed for Tarshish. Now, the text doesn't say this, but I can't help but wonder if Jonah thought to himself, well, you know, I... I know God said go to Nineveh, but look at, the ship is right here. And, and, and the fare is pretty cheap, it's affordable. So maybe this is what I should be doing. Even though by doing that, Jonah was living in direct disobedience to God. Folks, herein lies the lesson for all of us. When it comes to doing what God asks, there will always be a ship heading for Tarshish, 
In other words, there will always be an easy way out. The real question is, are we going to get on that ship? Are we going to look for some excuse, some rationale, some way to justify it? Or are we going to do the hard and difficult work of following God and doing what he's asking? Uh, in his book, Every Good Endeavor, the late Tim Keller, uh, he was a pastor in uh, New York. Well, Tim Keller tells a story about a guy named Howard. Howard was 27 years old. He was a young guy, and he was looking to move up in his career. Well, fortunately, he was given an opportunity to move from one really big company to another. Now, this new company that he was going to move to, it wasn't offering more salary, more money, but it did offer greater potential for career growth. And so for Howard, as somebody who wanted to advance in his career, it seemed like a pretty good move. So he was having conversations with this potential employer, and they were trying to negotiate his package. And one of the questions he was asked was, well, how much money are you making in your current job? And for a moment, Howard thought about lying. He thought about inflating his current salary by 4% which translated to a few thousand dollars. Now, he knew that that was wrong, so in his mind he thought to himself, well, you know what? This company that I might switch to, they only offer two weeks of vacation. My current company, they offer four weeks of vacation. So if I lie and they give me more money, well, I'm just offsetting what I'm going to lose in vacation. So it's okay. You see, that was the ship that he was ready to board. That was the rationale he was using. That's how he was going to justify what he was about to do. But then he had this moment of clarity. The Holy Spirit began to convict him. And he thought to himself, you know, if I do this, I'm sacrificing my integrity. I'm compromising my witness. And more money isn't worth it. It's just not. He decided to be honest instead. See, every day... We are faced with choices like that. Are we going to rebel against God? Are we going to get on that ship? Are we going to look for some way to justify it? Or are we going to do the hard but faithful work of doing what God wants? No matter how difficult it is. Jonah got on that ship, didn't he? Now the good news is, and we'll talk more about this next week, God pursued Jonah even in his rebellion. And yet rebellion was never a part of God's plan for Jonah. And rebellion is never a part of God's plan for us. God's plan for us always involves, it always entails obedience. And so by grace, let's exercise obedience to God, even when it's hard. Let's listen to God, let's respond to his voice, and engage in his will. Not just in some things, but in all things. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, forgive us when, like Jonah, we don't listen to you. When we would rather do our own thing. When we come up with excuses. God, remind us that even then you still forgive us. You still show compassion and mercy. And you still invite us to do what it is that you're asking of us. God, may we exercise obedience to you, even when it's hard. We pray this in your name. Amen.